The Donald Sterling situation, the botched execution in Oklahoma, and new revelations on the Benghazi scandal. I'm Taylor Kinsler, and this is The Square Circle. Welcome to The Square Circle. I'm your host, Taylor Kinsler. Joining us today are journalists Gregory Clay, Scott Greer of The Daily Caller, and communication strategist Don Owens. Welcome. Thank you. Uh, the big story this week was the rapid fall of Los Angeles Clippers owner Donald Sterling on Tuesday. Uh, NBA Commissioner Avid Adam Silver announced that he would ban Sterling from the NBA for life and fine him $2.5 million and lobby for the sale of the team. Now, everyone agrees that Sterling's racist views are important, but some worry about overreaction. For instance, Dallas Mavericks owner Mark Cuban said this week, if it's about racism and we're ready to kick people out of the league, then what about homophobia? Or what about somebody who doesn't like a particular religion? Or what about somebody who's anti-Semitic? What about a xenophobe? In this country, people are allowed to be morons. So Gregory Clay, does the punishment fit the crime or is Cuban he- worried that we're headed down a slippery slope? Excuse me. Well, I think uh, you're only on that slope if you have something to hide. You know, and, and that's what it is, I think, for, for anything. You know, uh, you know, and see, Mark Cuban is coming from a different um, situation, a different point of view. Why? Because he's one of the most outspoken owners. You know, when David Stern was the commissioner, he fined him so many hundreds of thousands of dollars because you know he would criticize the officiating, criticize David Stern, criticize this, criticize everything, and that's why he's speaking out because he he knows that he said he has said some very interesting things in the past. Um, and uh, if you have, you know, something to hide, then uh, yeah, of course you're worried about slow. And Cuban knows that he is known, you know, to say things you know, quickly and rapidly without a lot of uh, forethought. So, uh, um, but uh, it, it's, it's not about, you know, slopes to me. You know, it's about what's wrong and what's right. You know, because this, in this situation, I quote Dr. King from 1964. This is the 50th anniversary of 1964. When Dr. King said, the time is always right to do what's right. Anyone else like to weigh in? I'd like to jump in. I think Mark Cuban has lost it with these comments. He has confused his real world duties as an NBA owner with his Hollywood world duties as a uh, guest judge on Shark Tank. The being an NBA owner is a not a right, it's a privilege. And within that privileged group of billionaires, they have rules. And if you break those rules, one of the uh, consequences can be you lose your NBA team. As, uh, as you mentioned, Mark Cuban's been fined over a million dollars by the NBA. So when he asks the question, ironically, well, what, about, what if you say something that's homophobic? There have been players who've been fined, who've been suspended, and warned by the league for making homophobic comments. Including Kobe Bryant. Exactly. Yeah. So yeah. I don't know where Mark's coming from in this instance. Donald Sterling has 30 years of a track record of bigotry, discrimination, and uh, sexism against his own employees. This was just the chicken finally coming home to roost. I think it just was a, the NBA has been looking for a reason to get rid of Donald Sterling for a long time. He was the most hated owner in the NBA, and they finally got, they're in the, the Clippers are in the playoffs, they're on the national media market already, these tapes are released, no, there's no possible way anyone can defend them. So they basically took the opportunity to get rid of him. I mean, I think the NBA is already, it's already on that slope. The all these professional sports leagues, such as the NFL, NBA, and MLB, are all trying to present these, the squeaky clean image as humanly as possible as they can. Anybody says anything offensive, they're going to lose sponsors. They're going to have interest groups going after them. 
they, they don't want to deal with this. They just want to push forward a product. And while in another, in another instance, you do have the right to be a moron, the NBA is, of course, going to come after anyone who says these comments. And they're already down that slope. So as, as they pointed out, players have already been fined significantly for making comments they deem defensive. I'd like to remind our audience that you can submit your questions to our guests through our website at www.publicsquarenet.net and we'll answer as many as we can live on air towards the end of the show. Now, staying on the subject of the Sterling situation, one aspect that has not gotten much attention is the fact that Sterling's remarks were recorded without his knowledge or consent. Uh, some commentators have pointed out that, given the NSA data collection program and how it's so controversial, shouldn't we be more concerned about supposedly private conversations being made public? Uh, Scott Greer, what do you think about that? Well, we live in a day and age where there's really no barrier between the public and the private. You're gonna, people now, like sharing all their thoughts on Twitter, on Facebook, no matter what. And now people are getting, are now facing repercussions for that. Really what the main problem is, is not so much of the government hoarding your information, because even though that is a significant problem, with this case it is a private, it's other private individuals recording information that was probably technically illegal, and then using that information to give to other private organizations to go after uh, a fellow individual. And what happens is in these cases that you're now, Sterling is a public figure, but what if more private figures who keep their views to themselves are now become the targets of attacks? Such as when Brendan Ike, the former CEO of Mozilla, when his people found out that he had donated to Proposition, Proposition 8 campaign, which was in California to ban gay marriage, he was deemed unworthy to be the CEO and they went after him, even though he did not promote these views at the workplace. He did not, it was a private view, he just donated that money and then it became public knowledge. Now they argued that this alienated potential workers from working there, but then again, shouldn't we, sh people should be allowed to hold private views as long as they, as if they're not practicing in, them in a way that is illegal or is damaging to their company. And if you remember, during Adam Silver's news conference on Tuesday, when he announced the punishment for Donald Sterling, one of the media people asked him, how do you feel about um, a private taped conversation being at the core of this and you making a decision on a guy's life based on private conversation? And if you remember, Adam Silver's response was very concise. He simply said, well, it's public now. And that was it. So that told you where he was coming from. You know, so that's the thing I, I noticed about Adam Silver's news conference. Uh, the, the difference between him and David Stern, his predecessor as NBA commissioner, Adam Silver is very concise. You know, uh, did you all notice that? Yes. 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 Very, very concise. You know, s s David Stern has, has a tendency or had a tendency, now that he's retired, had a tendency to expound and extrapolate and on you know, he, you know, he was talk much, slow, much, much more slowly. You know, Adam Silver talks fairly fast. And, um, you know, he's, uh, Silver's quick and concise. But, but one thing about um, overreaction, the, the one thing that is in the background on this, and I think pe people have to be careful, especially the players, when you come on, so forcefully, as, as the players have, and former players like Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, who's been at the center of this, and Kevin Johnson, the former player, who's now the mayor of Sacramento, and LeBron James has spoken about this every day. You know, he, uh, you have to be careful about, you know, casting that stone. And now the players, I think, should view this as a wake-up call for them. Don't do anything crazy yourself, you know. I mean, you can't be hypocritical about this. You can't. Shout to the world, hey, we must get rid of, uh, of uh, Donald Sterling, you know, but, you know, but don't come out and have an uh, incident of your own, of your own creation, you know, down the road, you know, because then you are, you know, in the vortex. You will be in the maelstrom. And so just be ready for, for what's coming, you know, if you, a player, steps out of line, you know. 
I want to piggyback on that. I don't, I don't think you can conflate the two issues. NSA eavesdropping is something that continues to need to be investigated, needs to be examined, um, legality or illegalities that went on there. Um, equating that with Donald Sterling's comments are giving Donald Sterling far more credit than he should ever get in his entire lifetime. Donald Sterling, the, the, not only his words, but his actions. He settled with the federal government for housing discrimination charges. Um, it, is, it is racism in its purest form, and the worst part about it, it wasn't just his thoughts. He actually applied this in his workplace. Um, there's also a little bit more to this story. Um, reported this morning on ESPN's Mike and Mike, their flagship morning program, and this afternoon in Chicago Tribune, Donald Sterling is suffering from prostate okay. cancer. Mm -hmm. And yeah. one of the, he's 80 years old. And this girlfriend, assistant, however, whatever she's being termed these days, was semi-employed by him and is saying publicly that he asked that these tapes be made for posterity's sake. So this is a man who basically has been begging the NBA for a decade to find him out. And great reporters like Bill Simmons, a sports reporter for ESPN, uh, the editor at Grantland.com, wrote a great piece eight years ago that called out the NBA and said, one of your owners just settled over housing discrimination charges and you said nothing. But a player started a fight at the game and you suspended him and fined him. So the NBA bears just as much responsibility here. But Adam Silver did give a great press conference. Authoritative, no answer longer than 20 seconds, right. and very definitive. No, no uh, no space there to wonder, well, what if? You knew what was going on as soon as the press conference was over. To go on to, off your comments, it is true that Donald Sterling is quite possibly the worst person to represent any issue humanly possible. I don't think there's any way you can like the man on any level. But the real, the real thing here is how far will we go to go after people who might have offensive thoughts or thoughts that we consider to not be appropriate for public? Will we tape phone calls? Will we do this? Will we, how far will we go to make sure that, no, that basically nobody ever utters offensive thoughts? I mean, this is America. We do have freedom of speech. And you, these people did do it in a private setting. I mean, Donald Sterling is a very odd, absurd case that is that is definitely a terrible example of this. But like I said, with the Ike case, this was a man who made private donations, made sure they were anonymous, did not did not bring that stuff to the workplace, kept it in his, pri in his private sphere, and then he got published for it because people, private groups, went after him, found out that he gave that donation, and then basically harassed him and made sure they could not be a CEO of the company he helped build. So I, I think we just need to be a little cautious when we approach this issue. I mean, if Sterling, nobody cares that he's, I don't care that he's gone. But I think down the future in American society, we need to be cautious of how far we take this. I agree. Um, I'd also like to remind our audience again that you can submit your questions to our guests through our website at www.publicsquarenet or .net and we'll answer as many questions as we can live on air toward the end of the show. We're going to switch topics now. Um, uh, another story that's making headlines this week is coming from Oklahoma, where the state executed a man, but not before he suffered a seizure due to a new lethal injection formula. Now, some have said that this episode should renew a debate on what methods of execution constitute cruel and unusual punishment. Uh, Don Owens, what, if anything, does this case say about the death penalty? Well, Taylor, it, this is a great question. It's something that needs to be examined in America right now. I would say, personally, I support the death penalty. But I support the death penalty that is humanely and reasonably applied. In Oklahoma, this was not the case. Um, when we're going in the state, is going to execute an individual who's been convicted of a crime. We should make sure it is done humanely. We should make sure it is done justly. And we should be 100%, not 92, not 89, not 94, 100% sure that if we are using lethal injection to execute a prisoner, that we are 100% sure that, that the cocktail put together, approved by doctors, will kill that prisoner. And in this case, the governor of Oklahoma, who had been warned not only by the AMA, but other doctors within her state, that the medical cocktail put together by the state was not 100% sure that it would kill the inmate. And uh, the situation bore out. The man, for at least 10 minutes, suffered on the gurney. Now, I also want to add in, 
My first job out of college was as a probation officer. I worked for the North Carolina Department of Crime Control and Public Safety. I've walked through the death chamber at uh, the state, pr state prison in Raleigh. It is a very somber, a very realistic place when you realize that human beings convicted of crimes are meet their justice on that table. Um, I've grown increasingly concerned, however. A recent report put out um, just last week showed that approximately 4% of the people on Beth, death row today may be innocent. So again, that goes back to the statistic. If we're going to carry out criminal, uh, 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 the death penalty as a part of our criminal justice system, we should not be 92% sure. We should not be 94% sure. It should be 100% or we will be an unjust and inhumane society. And that's not what America stands for. But this case, um, it's very interesting. Uh, it it reminds me of what happened, oh God, well, what time period? It was the 20s, 30s, I believe. Remember when those test experiments were done on black males? Uh, uh, there were test experiments for syphilis. Syphilis, yeah, just Tennessee. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, and the guys didn't even know it. They didn't even know that, that they were essentially used as human guinea pigs. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they didn't and, even know it. And eugenics. Right, and eugenics. Yeah, and um, in fact, as I remember, there was a movie made about it. I think it was called Miss Evers' Boys. Mm -hmm. I think Alfred Woodard played the lead role. Um, You're exactly right. Yeah, that's what this, this case reminds me of. And it's, it's fairly obvious that in, in Oklahoma, uh, these prisoners are being you know, used in, in that context, basically as human guinea pigs. You know, well, well, we think it'll work, but we're not sure it, it might work. Okay, so let's try it out on some cat, okay, and see what happens. You know, I mean, you know, and I'm sure the thinking is that, well, he has to die anyway. So, you know, and I'm sure that's the, that's the, the hidden logic there. You know, and I, I think, that, I think that's, that's, what's, that's what's going on, you know, going on in Oklahoma. You know, uh, forget about the cruel and unusual punishment thing. Yeah, but uh, that's that's how I view it. I am also a, well, I'm not sure about yourself, but I am a supporter of the death penalty. And this case definitely shows the problems that we have with using, using lethal injection. For ever since basically the French Revolution, society has tried to find a humane way to kill, or kill people or condemn to the death penalty. And I think the... There's been, new, there's been numerous other cases where the lethal injection has also failed. Somebody sat there for like 10 minutes, it didn't work, they were paralyzed, they were clearly in pain, and it seems like it's not working. And also there's not a very, it doesn't seem like there's a 100% foolproof method for ensuring that this, that the injection works. So, but there is a form of death penalty that has actually been proven to be 100% humane, and it's, there's a foolproof test to make sure it works beforehand. Now, you might think this is crazy, but it's, was it, invented, it was popularized during the French Revolution. It's the guillotine. Now, we think of this as like crowds gathered, everybody yelling, and the king's head falling off. But what little people know is that France still used the guillotine as its form of the death penalty up until the late 70s when they actually banned, before, when they banned the death penalty. And there's a very easy way to test it. it. Only a split second of pain for the for the inmate, and it's done. I think I think as an American society, we just there might be I don't know why we are so hesitant to use other methods, but we want to just like stick a needle in somebody and watch them die. The it's like we want to take the death aspect out of it, but the death penalty is always going to be a messy thing. Or it's always going to be a nasty thing that we don't want to deal with. But we want to deal punishment to the most heinous of criminals. And this guy who in Oklahoma was very deserving of the death penalty. He shot and beat uh, a young girl and then buried her while she was still alive. And this is definitely one of those cases that definitely justified the death penalty. But we need to have a form of punishment that will be humane and not have mess ups like we had this week. But it's also important to remember the Constitution protects all Americans, whether they're imprisoned or imprisoned, excuse me, imprisoned or not imprisoned, from cruel and unusual punishment. And I think, going back to Mark Cuban's words, 
I think we're getting into a slippery slope when we go back to guillotining, guillotining people in the United States. <laughs> well, I mean, it wouldn't be public. It would be because it's not. We're not going to have like everyone gathered up in New York City. It's like, hey, in Wall Street. Square. Like, yeah, it's not going to yeah. be a public square. We're just it because France they took away the public square. Back in the early 20th century, they did it behind closed doors like we do the death penalty. It's not going to be... Well, there's still an audience. There's a there's a whole room with glass for 30 people to but see. What, but then that's... What's the difference between seeing a guy gas for life for a few minutes versus a head falling off? I think Saudi Arabia would say a big difference because they still behead people. And they routinely rank higher on the, the, I don't know the exact number, name of the report, but there's a like an inhumanity ranking that comes out every year. And America points fingers at countries like North Korea, like Saudi Arabia, for in their inhumane treatment of prisoners. I, I hate to bring Mark Cuban again because he's not, I'm not the biggest fan of him. That seems like a really slippery slope. Guillotining is <laughs> well, it's not, a, it's not as barbaric. We have this barbaric notion because it seems terrifying to us as and we probably should, we definitely should not show the, like a head falling off, blood spattering. That is not a pleasant sight to see. But this is death we're dealing to these criminals. And no matter how we deal it, whether we stick in a needle in him and he's like, you know, gasping while he chokes to death is what the normal death penalty does, it, it doesn't matter. We want it to have the most, if we want to have the most humane form of punishment, the guillotine is quite possibly it. Okay. I mean, for the prisoner. I mean, you, if you if you had the choice, what would you choose? Uh, the injection, which you could be sitting there for ten minutes in agonizing pain, or the guillotine. I, I think if I had a choice, I'd say two things. I'd choose to live in a just country that didn't torture its prisoners, and I'd ask the state to bring some doctors in to ask what they thought was more humane: lethal injection or having your head cut off. I I don't know what a doctor's opinion is on that, but I think. Based on the Constitution, the doctors are probably going to come down on lethal injection. But I'm not an expert. I'm taking lethal injection myself. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's what I'm doing. Yeah. Yes. To answer your question. You know, faced with that, with that dilemma. Yes. And by the way, I am for the death penalty also. Okay. Yes. You know, since you asked earlier. Yeah. 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 Because uh, some people, I'm sorry, just ha- just, just have to go. Yeah. yeah. It's uh. Um, you know, it's, it's have to go. I'm sorry. Yeah, it's. I think it's unjust to the to the victims, right. the, to exactly. the family. To why, if that guy had gotten just life in jail, got his meal served every day, he had his bed, and while he had buried their loved one alive and uh-huh. didn't care, he didn't. He showed no remorse, no remorse when he right. uh, in the video. So, but he shouldn't. We shouldn't, as a country, we shouldn't allow instances like that to have him fly there for forty minutes. Well, we're going to move on to a new topic now, other than beheading. But <laughs> finally, uh, new documents about the Benghazi scandal have surfaced this week, and, and some have called them a smoking gun. In the emails which were obtained by a court order, White House officials ordered alterations of messaging strategy and attempting to blame a YouTube video for sparking the attack in order to protect President Obama from pr- political criticism. Uh, Scott Greer, are these documents a smoking gun? And more broadly, is the Benghazi story still relevant a year and a half later? Well, I think what the media keeps overlooking in this Benghazi is the country takes place in Libya. You never, it's always like, we always talk about terror attacks, we always talk about this, but we don't focus on actually the Obama administration's policy in that country, Libya. We supported a rebel insurgency against, against Gaddafi, with, which Gaddafi was a brutal dictator, nobody doubts that, but he did provide stability to that country and he was willing to work with the West and the international community. Now we have a country completely in chaos, which this, as a result, we have an ambassador that is killed and then the administration tries to play around with it at the time because we're in election season, they don't want that embarrassment coming around. So when we, we really have to examine why we went to Libya, which we don't, which we, it's not covered that much in the, in the news media, and, we, and how it has affected both our, our country and our interests. When we have an ambassador killed in a chaotic country, which we, which we in some ways created because we bombed, we bombed Gaddafi, we supported the insurgents, and then these people with, which there is some r- rumored evidence that some of the weapons that was used in the attack was provided by the U.S. during when we supported the insurgents. So we, in essence, had we supported these insurgents, we armed them, and then they killed our ambassador. I think we need to look at the broader at the broader picture, and I think this is 
it is a smoking gun in the respect that it does make the administration look bad. And now even like outlets like MSNBC are starting to question Benghazi and starting to look into it. But we have to look back at the larger picture of how we conduct our foreign policy and in what interests do we do this. Yeah, this really makes the Obama administration look bad. I mean, with these talking points and coaching Susan Rice and all this stuff and making sure that she stays on a certain track and, and all this. And, um, it, it, uh, and from a media standpoint, it just gives Fox News Channel that much more ammunition. I mean, they, you know, because, you know, they were on the Benghazi thing from the get-go, you know, day after day after day, you know. And now, now you know they're going to amp it up big time now, you know. And, um, uh, you know, whereas in CNN, which has been obsessed with the Malaysia plane <laughs> thing, you know, I've never seen a network... So obsessed with one thing, you know, I, you know I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. I mean, this is, I mean, every day, like seven days a week, they have special panels every day, multiple panels. Report on the trash. Every, every, every little thing, you know, every time they come back from a commercial break, the graphic says breaking news. And you go, wait a minute, I heard that uh, this morning or yesterday, but it's breaking news again. But anyway, um, and, 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 and um, it, it, now the networks, especially CNN, I think we have to pay more attention to the Benghazi situation because CNN is basically kind of like, you know, push it to the side, you know. Unlike Fox, which has had it, had Benghazi, you know, at the forefront, you know, day after day. Uh, Fox has so honed in on Benghazi and Obamacare, you know, and uh, th that's their thing. CNN's thing is um, uh, the Malaysia plane. MSNBC appears to uh, just focus on anything for a liberal cause, you know, and, and constantly praise the Obama administration. But I think, you know, CNN and, and MSNBC especially are going to have to come off that and say, hey, wait a minute, you know, there's something more to this Benghazi situation, that, you know, that we can't overlook. These emails do tell a story, you know, about, you know, you, uh, using the C word. Somebody say, cover up. This is very. This is all very interesting here at Square Circle, but I don't think this story is in the news much more than five or eight days from now. The the, the Rhodes emails that were released um, earlier this week. There's nothing new there. Um, it, it regurgitates talking points that the CIA have put out in the past. Um, I, I just don't. Maybe if this was closer to an election, this might have some legs. But it's not going to have any legs in April or May. This story has been examined, re-examined, and examined again. If we want to really talk about what's at the root core here in this story, we need to be talking about if people on both sides of the aisle, Republican and Democrat, and even independent Bernie Sanders, if they want to talk about something that's really going to impact U.S. military life, U.S. intelligence life, and American citizens' life, especially our State Department employees, let's talk about what was the result of this. Was embassy security beefed up? Did Congress and the President work together to increase funding for embassy security? Was there an intelligence review to ensure, again, that this never happens again? But no, instead, what do we get? Slow leaks that aren't substantive stories, that don't help the families of the intelligence agents who died, they don't help America's, view, um, America's discussion around this issue, they don't help um, just sort of the general mood of Americans. Americans out there in, in, in the states are wondering, what the heck are you folks talking about in D.C.? Let's talk about how we fix this. And I, I don't think there's a story here. There's definitely a story here. Why? Because people die. Okay. It's that, that, never, never going to die in the conservative know? media. They're right. going to keep it alive. But I... It, the real question is how much to the general public, as in the voting public in 2016, if Hillary Clinton is, becomes the Democratic candidate, mm -hmm. how much will this issue impact voters? I'm skeptical that, that many voters will find, will base their vote on whether they're going to vote for Hillary Clinton or not, or Benghazi. I think it does have, unfortunately, it does have a shelf life. Even though people did die, we had an ambassador. This is... Right. A major catastrophe, and it was handled completely poorly. Well, and there needs right. to be investigation. Right. But I think, as in holding legs for 2016, unless there is another bombshell that's even bigger than this, I don't see it affecting the 2016 election. Yeah, but you know that if Hillary runs in 2016, the Republicans are going to hammer up Benghazi non-stop. It's going to be like 24/7. Oh yeah, that's and you know that because yeah. they know they can get her on that. She was in charge of the State Department at the time. That's on her. You know, and 
Um, and, and so it's going to be in the public consciousness anyway you know, if, if she runs because the Republicans are, are not going to let this go. Uh, I, but I think it's going to be more of an issue to fire up the Republican base exactly. more than appealing to the voters. I think uh, I, I, the conservative media loves it. Are, are the people who read outlets like The Daily Caller and Fox News really like it. I do think there is a story, and that's why we investigate it. And there's, it's been ignored by a lot of outlets. But in terms of the general voting public caring very deeply about the issue and that impacting whether they vote for Hillary Clinton or not, I'm skeptical. I'm not saying entirely <laughs> no. They could, uh, depending on future events, but I'm skeptical if it affects He's, he's right about one thing. The Republicans will hammer her. Right. And, but you're wrong about another thing. She'll do, uh, the Republican candidate will do well in red states. And uh, that doesn't portend well for the White House. I don't think you win the White House as a conservative on Benghazi. It just, there's not enough there. I think uh, if this is going to be a major strategy carried into the next election by the Koch brothers or by the RNC, I think uh, they should rethink that strategy because it's, it's not an effective use of their political talents, their money, or their focus. There are other issues out there that could garner more public uh, discussion. And look, I, I am, I, I'm a progressive. I'm a liberal. I support the liberal side. But I also want a, a, a reasonable discussion to be had about political issues that impact people's lives. And then I would say, look, going back to your earlier point, yeah, it is important that peop because people died. But we had 11 embassy attacks under the Bush administration. Um, and I believe I had the 13 embassy attacks. 11 people died. How big was, this, how big was the uh, political story then? I don't hear many people on either side remembering that then. And look, it doesn't diminish the service or the lives of those men who died in that embassy. But if this is a major political story this coming fall and in two years, um, I feel confident who's going to be in the White House. Okay, well, we're going to move on now. Um, we're going to take some questions from our viewers. So the first question comes from Ann Jordan. Uh, is anyone else upset about a public figure having a girlfriend who's young enough to be his granddaughter and his wife is apparently okay with it? I think this is back to our earlier topic, so does anyone want to weigh in? I, can I please jump in on that? I heard a great... <laughs> yes. I, I took the Metro into work this morning and I heard a great saying on the Metro and it said, if you're walking down the street with your girlfriend and your wife, I should be able to distinguish between the two. So if you're 80 and you're walking down the street, I should be able to tell if you're walking with two women, who is your girlfriend and who is your wife. Donald Sterling evidently didn't, didn't keep to that rule. And, uh, it's he didn't a, get the memo. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But see, the bottom line is this. I mean, it's, it's, it's simple, it's basic. And like everything else, it comes down to money. You know, when you're a billionaire, and I understand Donald Sterling worth between 2.0 and 2.5 billion, you can just do whatever you want. That's, that's it. It's not, it's not complicated. Uh, yeah, there are tons of examples uh, of powerful figures of politicians and others who are having wives 30, 40, 50 years younger than them, are possibly even mistresses in this case. So um, I think it just reflects on his character, and that's all I have to say. It would be interesting to see if the roles were reversed, if it was a female owner with a 30-year-old male uh, paramour also married. That's a great what, point. What yeah, the that media would be a story of its own, yeah. <laughs> yeah. What the is, media uh, narrative yeah. would be. Right, that is a great point. <laughs> yeah. How would people react and how would the media react then? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. Well, to continue on this topic, our next question um, is from Arthur Fuller, and he asks, you ask, does punishment fit the crime? What crime? His only crime was having a dumb private opinion, and are we now going to punish people just for having opinions that we do not like? Uh, to go on that, I think we we are starting to do that. I mean, I've said this before. Donald Sterling is a terrible example of this, but we are starting. There is more and more people who are going who are getting punished for saying stupid things with both jaw, with both their livelihood, their public reputation, their ability to do things. We're definitely not going down the route of Europe where they have hate speech laws where you if if Donald Sterling said this, he might be getting prosecuted and possibly facing jail time in certain European countries. So we're not down that path yet. But I do think in our country we are starting to punish people in their livelihood and not so much imprisoning them, but almost in some cases it's they can't find a job again. And, uh, 
I mean, Donald Sterling isn't going to have a problem with that, but if another individual, uh, his private views became out in public and his employer decided he didn't want to deal with that, you could just... But there is now public and the private sphere meeting, and I don't think it's a good thing. So yeah, The answer to his question is, if the government's coming after you, no, because constitutionally you have a right that the federal government cannot abridge your right to free speech. If you are a private sector owner of an NBA team and you're worth billions of dollars, employing private people, and you belong, there's only 30 of these positions in the world. It's an exclusive club being an NBA owner. They have a code of conduct, right. even among billionaires. Right. And if you break it, you can potentially lose your franchise. It's as easy as that. That's true. I mean, that's, that's the thing. Um, <clears throat> and it's not so much as prosecution and all that. He basically broke the NBA rules. You know, just like uh, uh, um, as Don said earlier, you know, players have been fined and suspended for saying homophobic slurs and everything. You know, Kobe Bryant, you know, one of the top five players in the league, was was fined heavily. You can be fined for talking about a referee, right? Exactly. <laughs> yeah. You know. Yeah. So I mean, that, that's the one thing that um, people have to remember. He he, he broke. Uh, the rules. Remember also that he helped create yes. because he's on the NBA board of governors. He he, he's a, he's a, he's an owner. He has a vote. Very good. You know, so he was involved in creating the bylaws of the NBA Constitution. You know? Yeah, it, it it is a bad example, but I do see there's more cases like this arising where people say things in private, and they get punished. So. That's just the that's just the society we live in today, unfortunately. And here's another point, and this is the one semi nice thing I will say about Donald Sterling all day. If you're going to be a virulent racist, if you're going to be married and date women fifty years younger than you are, you had better buy a lot of credibility and a lot of goodwill. Yeah. And that's the bottom line. He tried to do that with the NBA. Yeah. 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 Only five thousand dollars worth of yeah. <laughs> they, yeah. he, he, I guess they wanted more. Yeah, but they, uh, Donald Sterling had no credibility within the league. There was no one to stand up and fight for him because he had angered or, excuse me for saying, pissed off every ally he had yeah. over the last 30 years right. and produced a cheap team that no one liked to watch. Right. So, you know, it gets to the point where it's like strike one, strike two, right. strike three. This was a long right. time coming. Right. Right. And, uh, you know, the chicken came home to roost. Right. And now that he has a top five NBA team, mm -hmm. you know, he, the Clippers are in the limelight more now. He, and being the owner, by definition, he will be in the limelight more. Because the thing is that when a lot of this other stuff was going on, you know, like housing discrimination, and he had to pay the federal government $2.73 million or whatever, the Clippers were horrible. Mm -hmm. They were totally irrelevant. Okay. They, were, they were at the bottom five. Because remember, several years ago, Sports Illustrated voted the Clippers uh, the worst uh, franchise in pro sports. Mm -hmm. That's all of the four major sports. Mm -hmm. you know? And now... It's the the role is totally um, reversed. Now they are top five team. You know they are a great team to watch on TV. They're a fun team to watch. They have legitimate shot. You know, assume in, in, you know if they win um, game seven uh, uh, on uh, Saturday of, of winning uh, NBA championship. You know mm -hmm. they can make a great run in the playoffs. You know, assuming they can get over this all, all this drama, and uh, that's 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 the main reason. This, is, his, this has become a more relevant story because the Clippers now are uh, quote-unquote marquee team. Mm -hmm. And also remember, and I, I mentioned this earlier, the NBA bears an incredible amount of responsibility here because they waited too late to address this man's actions. And then also remember the economic side of it. Racism can get manifested when money is involved. And the uh, NBA didn't act right. until sponsors started pulling, pulling the ads. Right. Virgin, Atla Virgin yeah. Atlantic. CarMax. CarMax. Yes. It's like that old saying in the NBA, it's never about the money until it becomes about the about money. About the money, and, right. And, and now are. people are jumping over each other, telling the world, hey, I want to buy the Clippers. Mm -hmm. Oprah Winfrey. You know, are, are you kidding me? <laughs> are you kidding me? This will not have, you, you, you will not have dreamed of this 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. People... Coming out of everywhere. I want to buy the Clippers. Mm -hmm. 20 years ago, no, Carl, no way you want to buy the Clippers. Come on, no way. They'd have to pay you to yeah, buy the Exactly, <laughs> exactly. Now, people, now it's a prestige thing to say, hey, I own the Clippers. Yay. You know, it's wild how things can change in, in the United States of America. Yes. Certainly an interesting debate. But now it is time for the most underreported story of the week. Would anyone like to start? 
I'll uh, start. Oh, go ahead. No, 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 you go. I'll start. One, I, this is an item I read about yesterday, and I'm offended by it because I'm a connoisseur of a semi-common connoisseur of pop culture, and I love my musical artist, and one that I've admired for a long time, up until yesterday, was Erica Badu. Known worldwide as a neo-soul R&B crooner, makes very good music, very soulful, great music to spend a Friday night eating a good meal and, listen to a, and drinking a bottle of wine. Recently, she traveled abroad and received a, a, a huge sum of money to perform for an African dictator in Swaziland. And unlike most actors, performers who came back and re didn't realize they made a mistake, she came back and defended her decision to perform for this man who has imprisoned people, quelled political dissent, not allowed open and free elections, and then flies her across the world, uh, pays her an exorbitant fund of, uh, sum of money, brings in his own um, citizens, makes them sit captive in a, in a performance, and cheer for her. Um, that's just wrong. One of the responsibilities we have as Americans is to take the best of our ideals, the best of our actions, and, and as much as we can, at the citizen level, even up to the president, and show the world the best of who we are. And Erica Badu had an opportunity to do this, and she didn't. And unfortunately, for those people in Swaziland who are victimized, imprisoned, murdered, they're going to take, at least partially, that view of Americans and watch it leave with Erica Badu, and performers and entertainers particularly have to recognize they have a terrific opportunity to spread those ideals in the right way, not come back and make excuses on social media. So that's an underreported story that I think should not just uh, put the spotlight on Erica Badu, but all of our performers that go abroad. We need to keep that in mind because there are people out there who are suffering and want to vote and don't take rights that we take for granted for granted, and they should remember that. Um, well, this, on Wednesday, April 30th, Iraq had an election, and it wasn't really well reported, and one of the facts that's not been going around in the media is that an al-Qaeda links group, ISIS, Islamic State, in Syria, or in Iraq and greater Syria, which is also very active in Syria right now, has taken over many cities surrounding Baghdad and are on the move. And one of the, we had talked about in, in Benghazi about broader failure policy of Obama's team in in Libya, but the Iraq what this current situation in Iraq reflects a bad foreign policy that we've had since the Bush years. This is one of the major controversial controversies and conflict during the during the two thousands. And now that we see like Al Qaeda linked groups now taking over whole entire cities coming back stronger than ever, and not only is, which they're Sunni linked, but Shiite militias are also coming back, is looking more, more and more like Iraq might descend back into civil war, which is bad news for everyone. But it reminds us that we need to think back on our foreign policy and make better decisions in the future. Well, to Taylor, to Scott, to Don, the most undercover story this week as we enter the month of May, is, is the jobs report. I believe 288,000 jobs. That's the official figure. 288,000 jobs were created in the month of April. Um, that, to me, should get much more coverage. Um, I mean, that is an astounding figure. And almost 300,000. Um, and uh, to me, maybe some of them, um, maybe many of them are low wage jobs still, but 288,000, when you remember what, five years ago, six years ago, the, the country was losing 700,000 a month. And th th this figure should be trumpeted more, assuming it's correct. Uh, but because um, TV, of course, especially cable news, rules the news cycle. Um, the drama overtakes the jobs report. You know, the Malaysia plane, Donald Sterling, you know, uh, Benghazi. Clavin Bundy. Yeah, Clavin Bundy out in the desert of Nevada doing his thing. You know, uh, but I think that the jobs report should be talked about more in the media. Because, you know, maybe, perhaps, maybe it's a sign that um, the corner uh, is definitely being turned here. That, um, you know, things. 
are really, really getting better this time. Unlike in the past when we heard, oh, things are getting better. But maybe, no, really, really getting better this time. That's what we're all hoping for. Because, um, I mean, that's the highest figure in a long time. On that note, I want to thank you, all the guests today, for coming in and joining us. That's all for this week. Thank you for watching The Square Circle, and we'll see you next week.